nice to see you all here this morning. It was bright, sunshiny morning. Uh, we'll get started with announcements. We would appreciate everybody signing the friendship register. You'll find those at the end of the pew and passing it down to each person in the pew so you all have a chance to register your attendance. One thing to note, um, the church asks that you update your email address, especially if you're one that has not received email from the church in the past. So be sure to add that to Friendship Register as well. Uh, don't forget, we have a congregational meeting this afternoon following worship. So all those who wish to attend, please be sure to stay for that. VBS kitchen staff is seeking zucchini for vegetable sticks and other fresh vegetables that can be used in green salads to include in the daily meal plan of VBS. If you have some that you could donate, please bring them to the church next Sunday or during the week of VBS. Please see Patty Jones or Janelle Schauble with your donations. Thank you for your help. And along that same note, Peggy West has some announcements regarding BBS. You all thought since Jack wasn't here, you wouldn't have to hear all this stuff today, right? Um, Jack asked me to make a few announcements about Vacation Bible School, which is just a little bit over a week away, starting on July 28th. Um, we are still in need of two or three shepherds. The shepherd role in Vacation Bible School is to help us maintain controlled chaos. Um, you help uh, basically shepherd the kids from station to station. So we really, there's no planning involved, just someone who is available to be here each of those evenings um, to help us with the kids. It's a lot of fun. Um, registration forms, if you've noticed, are in the parlor. We have been collecting registration forms for the children in VBS, but I wanted to make sure you knew there is an adult study as well in VBS, and so we are asking that if you are interested in participating in that with um, First Presbyterian Church's interim pastor, Mark Merrill, that you fill out a registration form and get that to either me, Janelle, or Jack. Um, thank you, everybody, for all of the shoeboxes and the maps and the Christmas wrapping paper. We do have all the shoe boxes and the maps that we need right now. Thank you very much. We are still collecting for Operation Christmas Child, the items that go in the shoe boxes. It's part of the mission project for VBS. We're doing really well with the school supplies, but could use some more toothbrushes, toothpaste, uh, small toys, small coloring books, and things along those lines. The children will also be bringing those things throughout VBS, but it's really nice for those who can't uh, purchase or bring those items that there are some of those here that we can contribute. And finally, um, we are asking for um, anyone who might be interested in baking some cookies for VBS. This is kind of a tradition. If you would like to do two to three dozen cookies to contribute, please let Patty Jones know, and we'd be very grateful for those. Thank you. And now we'll prepare ourselves for worship by listening to the prayer. <laughs>
If you are able, would you please stand for the call to worship? All are welcome as we gather today to worship God. We come from different places. We have lived different lives. Some may be further along in their walk with Christ. Hymn is number 24, the God of Abraham praise. <laughs> come forward for a children's moment. had security blankets. I don't know that I ever had one as a, a little girl, but I have one now. Did you know that? Isn't that weird? Did you know that adults can like security blankets too? It's, 
It's kind of weird, I'll tell you about it. Well, about a year ago, I got really, really sick. And I didn't even had to go to the hospital. Well, I got a gift in the mail. And I'll show you what it was. You can probably guess it's a sentence. Well, it is. It is a blanket. This was mailed to me by my girlfriend. I was so sick that I, all I could do was sit in a chair during the day or sleep in bed at night. And that when I put this blanket all around me in my chair and I would bundle all up, I could feel, even though she wasn't with me, I could feel loving arms around me. Isn't that neat? It just made me feel loved to have this blanket. Well, I don't know if you realize, would you like to touch my blanket, by the way? Can you feel the love in it? No, huh? You know what? It, I think it was because it was meant for me. I can feel it every time I put it around me. And I think as she was knitting, well, I think she crocheted that, but if she did that, she was thinking of me and giving me her love. It almost makes me want to cry as I think about it. Well, I don't know if you noticed when you walked in here. Did you see all these colorful blankets? Well, there's several people in our church who decided that they want to do this for other people. They want to make a prayer shawl, they're calling them, to give to somebody who's not well, or somebody who's having a really, really hard time in life, or maybe somebody who's this close to dying just for them to know that they are loved. And so today we're, you're going to hear a little bit more about that, or at least your folks will if they're here. We'll hear a little bit more about, we're calling it a prayer shawl ministry. And I started doing that too because I know what it feels like to get one of these. So even though you guys are probably not knitters, you probably haven't crocheted, you might someday want to learn how. But even still, you'll know what these people are doing that are making these and how they're giving God's love to other people through their prayer shawls. Okay, can you bow your head? Dear Lord, thank you so much for these four young men, for the future that they have ahead of them and for all the ways that they will be able to show your love to people around them, too. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> This time I would like to call Ellen Tingley to come up to the chancel. Ellen is um, a fairly new member of our church and she moved here from the state of Tennessee, not to be confused with the town of Tennessee on the other side of Colchester, which I have done. Uh, but she has moved here and she has brought the prayer shawl ministry to our congregation and I would like for her to give you some information about that and to maybe um, let us know who has gotten involved with this ministry. So, Ellen, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Pershaw Ministry came to me in Tennessee about seven years ago, and a friend in Texas told me how wonderful it was to do this. I'm like, okay, good. I'm glad you're doing it. I'm glad you enjoy it. And so I ordered a book, and once I read the book on the people that received them, the people that made them, it just I knew I had to be involved. So we started the prayer shawl ministry with four of us in our church in Tennessee, and I think we had nine here when we organized. I'd like for the women who are involved in this, if you would stand up so people know who you are, if you've made a shawl, or if you're working on one, or you want to do one.
think they're pretty talented from the looks of what they've done in a month. I was shocked. Anyway, when you give someone a prayer shawl, you're letting them know that you do love them and they are being prayed for. And once in a while, we give one to someone for a happy occasion. I have one up here I've made for a baby to be born and one for a friend who's going to be 90 years old in uh, Peoria. I'll give it to her. But um, we just want them to know that we are thinking of them and hope that they will feel the comfort like Jan talked about when they use it. Um, if you need a shawl or you know someone who does, you may see one of these ladies or a Stephen minister or Kelly will have access to these shawls. And they're here for you when you see someone that, that is in need of a, a shawl. Um, at our meetings, we meet about once a month and uh, we work on shawls and we talk about who will get them and just kind of get together and decide what we want to do. And then we have Kelly come down and ask him to bless them so they're all blessed before you receive one. And I'd like to ask Kelly to do that now. Thanks. Thank you again, Ellen, for your leadership. And to all of those who are involved, thank you for your time and energy. I know that um, we have had a few already go to people, and they have appreciated them immensely. Some people within our congregation and some people outside. It's not just for us, it's for anybody in need. And so we're thankful that we can provide a security blanket for someone in need. Shall we bless these beautiful, beautiful artistic creations? Let us pray. For the work of our hands, God, we give thanks, especially for those whose hands have created these beautiful shawls. It is our prayer this day that these shawls can be used as they are intended to bring your peace, your comfort, your hope, your health, your friendship to those in need. May these representations of our faith help others to come to know of your love and grace. May these shawls bring the peace that is necessary for one to get back to healthy living. We know that in our most difficult moments that you wrap your loving arms around us. For those who receive these shawls, may they feel your loving arms. May they know your peace and may your grace be extended to all involved. We give thanks for the opportunity to know these great gifts of faith and to share them with those who need you most. So we offer these shawls to you to bless and to pour your love in so that others can come to know you. All this we pray in the name of the Christ. And the people said, Amen. Thank you again to everyone involved. I would share with you our congregational concerns as we know them at this time. We will start with the joy. Mary Stepanovich met with her doctor in Chicago on Thursday, and she can eat anything she wants now. So that was the last thing. She was. Uh, she told me last week as she was leaving with her son and daughter-in-law, if they clear me to eat, watch out. So, uh, so she's uh, well on her way to health, and we give thanks for such good news. The Drakes have a friend, uh, Bob Howard, who will be having surgery soon, and so. Uh, from a difficult family circumstance, so we keep them in our thoughts and prayers this day. Norma Kenner's son in Nashville, his name is Terry, has a back injury, and she's been with him for a little over a week or around a week, and so um, hopefully there's some healing going on there, and we look forward to hearing good news soon. Um, Emma Bozark, Jill Jones's daughter, uh, had an emergency appendectomy surgery last week. And um, Jill flew down and back already, so she uh, has been with Emma during that time. We're glad to hear good news and that she is on the mend, and we're glad you had safe travels to go and be with her. So We have had um, two members of our church who have experienced death this last week. Gail Randall's sister, Vera White, passed away in Galesburg, and the funeral is tomorrow at 1 and visitation this afternoon. 
and uh, Betty Sherwood's mother, Helen Martin, passed away just this morning, and uh, there is no date for a memorial at this point, but we want to keep you, Gail, and Betty, and all of your families in our prayers. These are all the concerns that we know of at this time. As we come into our morning prayer time this morning, let us lift these people up. For those concerns that have yet to be mentioned, but God knows, let us lift those up as well. Let us begin our morning prayer in silence. To your presence again this morning good and gracious God and we ask once again for your help your help for those who are struggling going through difficult times needing to know those great gifts of faith peace love hope health comfort security for those whom we have mentioned we offer to you for those whom we have left unmentioned we offer to you for you are a great God and you know so many things, and you can be present in so many ways. And for that, God, we are so grateful. Yes, we come asking for help again, because we need you so badly. We make such a mess of things sometimes, God. Sometimes we confuse you in this world. Sometimes we don't know how to turn to you in this world. Sometimes we just turn our back on you. We look around our world and we see and hear of war. We pray for those who live in war areas. We pray for those who are being bombed. We pray for the families of those who have lost their loved ones because of the shooting down of a plane. These huge concerns seem far away and seem distant, and so it's easy to kind of just listen to them and ignore them, but God, you call us not to ignore these things. You call us to find ways to spread your peace and your love in this world, and it's so overwhelming we don't even know how. We don't have to look far, though, God. We can look even in our own community. We can see that people don't treat each other as well as they need to. We can see As we walk through grocery stores, how people will treat each other, even their own family members, we hear of the ways that people are not neighborly. Move us from apathy. Stir within us courage. Create in us a willingness to be your faithful people in all moments. It is difficult. We'll admit that. It is difficult. And yet, if we can just find such courage, if we can just find such faith, God, we will know you more completely. We will have a confidence and faith that we haven't had before. And your world your creation can be as you intended, full of your love, your joy, your compassion. So on this day, when the news seems so overwhelming and our mistakes seem to pile upon each other, provide for us your grace, your forgiveness, and your love. We pray all of these things in the name of your Son, the one we Christians call Christ and Messiah. We pray words 
that he has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever.
Thank you so very much, Martin and Kevin. That was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. This weekend has been full of beautiful music for me. I had the good privilege to go to Quincy and see Les Mis in uh, the Quincy Community Theater. And for community theater, that was pretty good. This was pretty good, too. <laughs> I've been um, fortunate and blessed. We come into our fourth week of a five-week sermon series, Things That Make Atheists Go, Hmm. We've been asking ourselves, what kinds of questions do people have of people within the faith? I've had conversations with atheist friends. I've had a, an atheist friend from college listen to my first three sermons and give me a full page of feedback. He's invited me to be in conversation with his atheist friends who could provide even more feedback. I'm a little frightened. <laughs> He's very smart, and he makes some really good points. And he points out some difficulties with my sermons, possibly. But it's been a good conversation. I hope for those of you who have been around for many of these sermons, you're finding good conversation. Maybe conversation in your own head. Maybe good conversation with other people within our church. We're not identical. We are not twins of each other in the faith. Today, that may be even more apparent as we consider this idea of whose God is right. Whose God is right? Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Let us hear scriptures. It comes to us from Genesis 12 and the Gospel of John. It is printed in the bulletin if you'd like to read. If not, listen along. Let us hear the word that will inform our message this day. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you. And make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and the curse the ones who curse you. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. To the gospel. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you will know my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. May God add blessing and understanding to the hearing of this word this day. Atheists do ask that question. Whose God is right? Forget the things that we've been talking about these last few weeks. If God knows everything or if God is completely and totally all-powerful, their thought is, if God exists, how do we know which God to worship? Which one? Buddhism, Hinduism, Judaism, Islam, Christianity, Christianity, the faiths that used to be that no longer are, the faiths that continue to come up and surface. I mean, these are the majors. These are the ones that we know about. These are the ones that seem most likely. How can one understand it all? How can one interpret it all? How can one religion profess to have a certain truth about God? These are the questions of the atheist. Remember, we've discussed the fact that the younger you are, the more likely you will have no faith. Not a, a religious faith, anyway. You might have a faith in the human race, but you won't have a faith in the divine. That's the possibility, the younger you are. But for those who are young and actually have some thought about who the divine might be, some thought about who God is, and this is not just Christian young people, this is young people across the way. They believe this. They believe that there's one God and that all those faiths that we've just mentioned are just manifestations of the one God. Just an attempt to try to understand who this, this God, who probably is beyond understanding, is. This is their way of thinking. I shared in the newsletter this week that someone from one of my classes asked one of my professors in seminary, hey, um, could this be the case? One God and just different ways of approaching and understanding? And, and the professor said, that could be insulting. That could be an insult to the Jew to say that the God of the Muslim is the same as theirs? Could it not also be insulting of other faiths to lump us all into one category? 
But part of the question about whose God is right is based on the fact that atheists look at the world and they see that certain parts of the world are certain faiths. And they just say, by the luck of the draw, where you're born is the faith you have. So how can it be? How do we approach this God? How do we get there? And we're looking at the major faiths. Let's just look at our own, Christianity. We have two major parts of Christianity. We have Catholicism, which at one time was the only church, until the 1600s when Protestantism became a part of the Christian faith. We're Protestants because we're not Catholics. So we have Catholics and everybody else who are non-Catholic, Protestants, and just within the Protestants, how many churches are meeting this morning in Macomb with a different name? Presbyterian, Methodist, Baptist, Church of God. And we can go on and on and on. Let's just look in our own denomination. We're part of a movement known as the Restoration Movement, the Campbell Stone Movement. Those are our forefathers. And they began a church based on unity. Becoming one, maybe not agreeing, but coming to the table. But within the life of our short history, we've had two major splits. A church based on unity that's had two major splits. In the 1920s and 30s, the Church of Christ split from us. You know, they've had a split on their own. Instrumental and non-instrumental. In the 60s, we split from the independent Christian church and created two denominations again, the Christian Church of Sobs of Christ and the independent Christian church. A denomination based on unity, a movement based on unity, and yet we've split. How difficult would it be for someone who hasn't been raised in the church to try to figure all this out? I mean, it's difficult enough for us, and we're on the inside. So it's no wonder to me that people ask, which one? Whose God is right? Our scriptures today kind of illustrate the point to some degree. In Genesis 12, we get Abram and Sarai. We know them better as Abraham and Sarah. This is before their name change in chapter 17 in the book of Genesis. But in Genesis 12, God says, I have this idea and I have this way of wanting to work through you. I want you to move away from your family. I want you to go to a hill eventually and I want you to see this land that I'm going to give you. Your generations, your descendants are going to be as numerous as the stars. And I will do this great thing in you. And I will create this strong nation through you. And I will bless you. And through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Wouldn't that seem enough? If God makes this promise and says that everyone can be blessed through this one family... Abram, Abram and Sarai, Abraham and Sarah, that, you know, some people might look at that scripture and say, wouldn't that just be enough? Why does there have to be more? And yet we get to the Gospel of John, and we get those words, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. As Christians, we hold on to those Hebrew passages because not just in Genesis 12, but as we get into other passages, especially in Isaiah, we hear these things about who the Messiah is going to be. And in Genesis 12, everything is new and exciting and we're looking forward to something. Once we get to the prophets, once we get past the heyday of Israel, when they've been taken into captivity so many times, when they've been dispersed all over the world that they can no longer be their own nation. We start getting these passages of the one who will come to save Israel, the one who will rebuild them into a strong kingdom, the one who will come and fight Rome, the one, the one we Christians say is Jesus of Nazareth, 
the one who came to say, there are ways to come to know God. There are ways to live in this world. And in the Gospel of John, we get that beautiful language. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. A lot of people hang their head on that one scripture. A lot of people say, this is, this is the reason that I believe. This is the reason that I think my religion is more correct. Gail O'Day warns us not to use these scriptures in a way that pits Christianity against others, against the other religions. She has written part of a commentary in the New Interpreter's Bible. Anytime I've been speaking about John, I've been informed by her words before. She's from the Candler School of Theology in Atlanta. She's well respected. She says that the reading of this passage needs to remain in the context of the first century. She explains that Jesus was speaking to a specific group of believers and faith community. When he uses the word, the way, she says, uh, Jesus is actually picking up on a word that's been used by lots of religions in that day and even preceding Judaism. And in Judaism specifically, when they use the word, the way, they're talking about a specific opportunity, a, a direction, a path to come to know God and to live in this world in right ways, the way. And so Jesus, using this historical language, says, I am the way. He's saying to a group of believers in the first century, here's the path. We've been in this relationship together. You have seen me. You have known me. Because you have known me, you can know God. She also writes these words. The claim of John 14, 6 and 7 becomes problematic when it is used to speak to questions that were never in the fourth gospel's purview. To use these verses in a battle over the relative merits of the world's religions is to distort their theological heart. It is a dangerous and destructive anachronism to cite John 14, 6 and 7 as the final arbiter in the discussions of the relative merits of different religions, experiences, and understanding of God. The fourth gospel is not concerned with the fate, for example, of Muslims or Hindus or Buddhists, nor with the superior superiority or inferiority of Judaism and Christianity as they are configured in the modern world. These verses are the confessional celebration of a particular faith community convinced of the truth and life it has received in the incarnation of Jesus Christ. I would add that these words are only spoken one time. We have four Gospels, and much is shared in the Gospels. But what we know of John's gospel is this, is that it's the last written. It's written at a time when the Jews and the Christians in that day and time were at battle with each other. They were at war. They were sparring. They were fighting. They were arguing like a church split. You see, there were Jews who came to believe that Jesus was the Messiah. There were even others, non-Jews, called Gentiles, who believed that Jesus was the Messiah. And then there were Jews who did not believe that. And so in their world, they were arguing. They were having heated debate. They were battling each other physically. No one wins a church fight. There are people in the world who would want to say that because of this one scripture, that we as Christianity, we as Christians, have the right to say, we've got it all right. And that people should believe like us. How do you feel about that? I wonder. It's a hard passage. It's a hard piece of scripture to live out 
in the 21st century. Brian McLaren has a book. It's entitled, Why Did Jesus, Moses, the Buddha, and Muhammad Cross the Road? Christian Identity in a Multi-Faith World. You might find that peculiar, that title. You might think it too whimsical for such a serious topic. But in his intro, McLaren asks, if these religious figures were standing at a crosswalk, waiting to go across, would they be vying and battling to see who was right, to see who was more closely connected with God? Would our Jesus, those of us of the Christian faith, would our Jesus be battling it out saying, I've got it all right, so you need to get behind me and not beside me? He says that he wonders if Jesus would do something different than live out our fears and our worries and our ways of living. And if Jesus would be more like the Jesus who bent down and washed the feet of the disciples, if Jesus would be in conversation with those who might be the least of these, that he would be in conversation with even these religious figures to say, how is it? How is it that we might work together? It's kind of the premise of his book. He talks about in the third chapter where he, he has just gotten married. He and his wife sign a lease on an apartment, get married, and go on their honeymoon. So they're getting ready to come back to this apartment. They're going to get off the plane and go straight to this apartment that they've never lived in, that they've never been in together. His brother decides that he will help move all the stuff in. So he moves all the stuff in. They have, you know, ragtag furniture from all their family members. And uh, so they're excited as they're coming home from their honeymoon to spend their first night together in their new home. Well, in preparing the apartment for Brian and his wife, the brother decides to play a practical joke. He decides to blow up balloons and put them in the bathroom. And he just put balloon after balloon after balloon after balloon. McLaren doesn't even know how he got the last dozen or so in because it was so tight that they couldn't even open the door. They get home to their new home from their honeymoon around midnight. They've driven from the airport to their apartment and they're kind of in need of the bathroom that they can't open the door to. And they don't want to be those bad neighbors who have just moved in, who sound like they're having a party on their first night in their new apartment. <laughs> they don't want people to think that their marriage isn't off to a very good start and that they're fighting and arguing and shooting at each other as they're trying to pop these balloons at midnight. So they reach in gently and start to pull the balloons out one by one by one until they can open the door finally. They're exhausted after a long day of traveling. And Brian just says, you know what? I'll take care of this tomorrow. Let's go to bed. He wakes up early the next morning, letting his wife sleep in. And he's looking at his apartment, which is full of balloons. He said there must have been a million of them. And he goes out and he sits on the stoop of his brand new apartment. When a few seconds later, a little eight-year-old boy comes whizzing by and says, oh, you're the new guy, and off he goes. McLaren is still there, and a few minutes later, the boy comes back, and he sits down right, right alongside, and he says, hello, my name is Atif, and I'm eight years old, and I came to this country from Iran, which means he's Muslim. It's the first time McLaren has ever met someone who's Muslim. They begin having their conversation, and about one minute into it, a light goes on above his head. He said if it was a cartoon, you would have just seen a light go on. He said, Atif, do you like balloons? And Atif is like, well, yes, I do. And he opens the door and he shows, and there are balloons just floating all over the floor, covering every inch of carpet in the apartment. And Atif looks at him and he says, Brian, I can help you with this. 
<laughs> I can help you. He runs off. Turns out that when he returned, he just ran right in. Door was shut. He didn't knock or anything. He just came right in. Brian says that that would be the case with the thief. He never found a door he needed to knock on. Behind him were all the kids from the apartment complex. Some this size, some this size. And they all just started grabbing as many little wounds as they could. And they took them to their homes. And then they came back for a second round of balloon taking. And at that moment, they, he and his wife were loved by all the kids and despised by all the parents. <laughs> they were the cool balloon folks. Atif became a regular, just coming through the door. Turns out that he and his mom, Liza, had come to the United States from Iran to be with their dad, who had decided that once they arrived, he did not want to be with them, and so they were left alone. Liza spoke very little English. Atif, being a young child, learned English as only a young child can learn English, and was doing very well in school. His mom struggled with her language, but did find a job at McDonald's. They became friends. They became friends. And Liza would say thank you for the friendship by bringing food, leaving it at their doorstep. Native dishes to Iran. Brian says he began to like the food. But more importantly, he, became to, he, 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 he came to like the people. And that from that point on, he saw them not as someone who was dangerous, not someone who was foreign, someone who was an enemy, but someone who dealt with the same daily struggles that he was dealing with as he was going through and getting his doctorate in school. They were dealing with life pressures in the same way that he was dealing with life pressures. They were dealing with the same rodents and cockroaches that he was dealing with in his apartment, he says. He writes these words. The standard approach to Muslims for my conservative evangelical upbringing was clear. Be nice to them when necessary in order to convert them to Christianity. Otherwise, see them as a spiritual competitor and potential enemy. In effect, this approach tended to dehumanize the other, turning others into evangelistic targets, an ugly phrase if ever there was one, rivals and threats. Atif had no interest in being converted, and as a child, he was neither rival nor threat. His jubilant, exuberant, invincible humanity overwhelmed any move to dehumanize him, and so he began converting me, not from my Christianity to his Islam, but from an old kind of Christian identity to a new kind. As a naturally bold and precocious child who never learned to knock before entering, he was determined to be part of my life in all his charming, irreducible humanity, unless I locked the door. I'm glad I didn't. He goes on to say that it's not about giving up our Christian faith, but maybe seeing it in a new way. In this multicultural, in this multi-faith world, we should never apologize for who we are. I will never apologize to another type of believer. I will never apologize to a non-believer for being a Christian, for being a disciple of Christ. It's who I am. It's how I understand the world. It's the lens in which I have learned to live I'll not say I'm sorry for that. But I'm never going to ask anybody to make the same claims about God that I make. I don't understand it all. You've heard me say time and again about that phrase that I coined in seminary. Confessionally definitive. I can only confess what I can confess. I can only know what I know. And it defines my very being. That's what faith does. I'm sure the same is true of you. 
So again, I say it to you. Be the Christian that God has called you to be. Don't apologize. But don't live in fear of people who have a different name than you. Understand that this God who is the God of us all somehow will take care of us all. There's so much going on in our world right now. Wars in Northern Europe. Wars in the Middle East. It's so hard to think that it's just all politics. As part of the atheist thought is that through history there's been so much bad that has been wrought by faith. People with faith. How can it be? My friends, let our faith be real and courageous. And let us overcome any bad history that we have by right living today and tomorrow and from on. Let us be the people who bring in the kingdom. Let us be the people who bring in God's love, God's peace, and God's grace. Let us bring the best to the world. It is in that way that we will definitively confess whose we are. It is in that way that others can come to know of God. It's the hope we have. Because <coughs> God is right, I'm okay to say, I don't know. But when it comes to God, this is what I know. This is our call as disciples of Christ. May it be so.
table which symbolizes peace and hope and grace and love and all the good things that God has to offer us. This table, which is where Jesus sat at his disciples, with his disciples on his last night. This table, which can bring unity to those who may call themselves by different names. This table, this communion, which almost every Christian shares at one time or another. We gather here this day as the people who call ourselves Christian, followers of the Christ. Let us find, let us find what those original hearers of Jesus' words might have found when they sat at table with him. Let us pray. O oh, powerful God, you made a covenant with our ancestors and promised them more numerous descendants than the stars. Through your good grace, you have always broadened the horizons and the hopes of your people. Even in the midst of trial and exile, you bless us with never-ending love and compassion and move us to joyfully respond to your call. This table and this bread bring us to you through your Holy Son. Through this table, you have opened the hidden ways of your love for us. Lift our broken spirits and make us whole once more. And may this bread bring comfort to those seeking it most today. Amen. Heavenly Father, we come to your table this morning with thankful hearts. We thank you for all the blessings you've given us, and we're especially thankful for the promise made through your Son, Jesus Christ, that we might know of your salvation. As we take the cup, may it be a reminder of the blood that was spilled for our sins, and may we remember the promise made in the upper room so many years ago. Help us, Father, to live in love, and may your spirit guide us as we live in peace. Amen. When Jesus sat at table with his disciples, he took bread and he blessed it, and he broke it, and he gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. And after the meal, he took wine, and he blessed it, and he poured it. gave it to them saying, this is my blood shed for you. Each time you eat of this bread and drink of this cup, remember me. As followers of the Christ, let us remember the one whom we call Savior, the one who is the center of our faith. Let us find the strength and courage we need to be his followers as we share in this holy communion.
receive a blessing and pass it on is like the running pure water of a river. But to receive and hoard is like the dead, stagnant water of a pool that receives and keeps what it gets. In time, the dead pool stinks, and so does the all-get, never-give person. You have received a smile, pass it on. A kind word, pass it on. A helping hand, pass it on. A visit, when ill, pass it on. Encouragement when ready to faint, pass it on. A lift when you fell, pass it on. Forgiveness when you blundered, pass it on. Direction when you went astray, pass it on. Sympathy when your heart was heavy, pass it on. And assistance when you were down and out, pass it on. Pass on more than empty words, live your faith. Pass it on without fanfare. Pass it on freely and unselfishly. Pass it on, not out of vanity, but of true commitment. The deacons will now wait for so many blessings from you that we so appreciate. 
Help us to be able to share that same kindness to others by passing the blessing along. Use us and these our offerings to bless others, we pray. Amen. We now have the opportunity to commit and recommit ourselves to the one we call the Christ, to our God, who makes sense to us, even if not to others. As we come into this time, we invite anyone who would like to become a member of First Christian Church to come forward during the singing of our, for, uh, of our closing hymn. Let us confess our faith as we sing the hymn, O Christ, the way, the truth, the life, page 432. Just a reminder that we do have a congregational meeting um, directly after the service. We will have that meeting in this room. So for those of you who plan to stay and hear the um, ideas for renovations and the ideas for financing and paying for our renovation projects, please um, remain in the room. For those who may be going away, don't feel like you have to. We're more than welcome to have you join us and hear our plans as we um, are moving forward with something we've been working on for some time. We're excited about those and we have some good conversations to have. Do you remember that old marketing, No Fear? Do you remember those commercials from like the 80s and the 90s and maybe even into the 2000s? No Fear. Go forth. Be fearless. Be the person that God has called you to be, centering your life on the one we call the Christ. No apologies.